Good morning. This is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for February 24th, 2020. We'll begin with the appeals calendar. Continued hearing items. Item number one, 2017 144A, 2530-44th Street, Queens. There we go. Just in time. So after eight hearings and two adjournments, the property owner realized what I suspected would happen all along that it wouldn't be able to make the changes to the building necessary to comply with the requirements of the building code and the multiple dwelling law, because they're extensive for three units, um, hence cannot meet the conditions of the variance. Department of Buildings requests that the certificate of occupancy be revoked to revert the CO back to the two family that was permitted in 1980. I agree that's what we have to do. That was the condition of the grant in the first place. And we need to also revoke the variance or yeah, rescind it or yeah. however. I, I, I don't know whether we can do that without adding the variance. That, so 2017-144A is the appeal, yeah. right? Yeah. We don't have the variance anymore traveling along with it. So we need to. No, because to we granted it. So that's 103.79 easy, right. I think it is. So we need to add it. I don't know whether we can add it right now. Can we do that? We on could a motion? potentially allow them to withdraw by letter. Okay. But wasn't wasn't the other variance conditioned on a condition that this one that Yes. Then if we if the condition if we decide on this one and this one is done, I believe automatically the other No, no, but we have to actively revoke it, otherwise there's nothing on any record that shows that the variance has been revoked. And the other so, application, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. So, no, so just to clear, you know, this is an application for a revocation of the C of O, right, brought by the Department of Buildings. We decided the variance already. And so unless we actively kind of recall the variance, there won't be anything on the record as to that variance, that the variance is no longer valid because they failed to, failed to comply with the terms of the grant. So like we do with compliance hearings, we bring them in and we say, you know, you have to comply with the terms of the grant. In this case, they've told us they can't comply, so we need to actively re revoke or rescind whatever the right terminology is. So we can give them an option, but my question is if they don't take the option to voluntarily relinquish the variance, since we're doing this tomorrow, would we be able to join these together just like that on sort of an, um, on a motion to bring that other one up? Do you want to add it to the calendar? That, I'm just asking technically, can we do that? I think. I just, um, if I may, just to clarify. So it would be a relinquishment of the amendment of the variance. No. Oh, yes. Yes. True. To convert because it back original... to its 1979 iteration. Correct. So, right. They, they, could, they, could rel they could request to relinquish right. the amendment and just revert back. To the two family. Right. But, but what I'm saying is if the applicant doesn't do it voluntarily, do we do it? Do, do we then call up the application and say, that the amendment to the variance is revoked and we revert back to the 1979 variance. And if yes, which is I think what we have to do if they don't volunteer, can we do it tomorrow by just adding it to the calendar? I believe, I believe if, if, if there is a compliance issue, but let's say the other variance is like a, any other regular variance and there is a condition on it, and we believe that they are not complying. What we do is we, we schedule it for a hearing, for a compliance hearing. Right. And the reason for that, I believe, is to give the applicant a chance to provide us with feedback. Right. Since we already got the feedback, which, okay, we're not going to be able to do it, we're not doing it. So there is no reason to wait. I believe Right, because sure. they've already had a conditional, they've already had an extension because we put a condition in the resolution of that variance. Mm -hmm. Extension that I'm <coughs> okay. So right. I think so. We don't have to talk about this anymore. But I think I would we need like to just to add it to the lineup. Yeah, right? we need to add it to the lineup. All right. Mm -hmm. It's either one hundred three or one hundred four seventy nine BC. Sorry, I don't remember either one. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right. Item, a special order calendar, item number two, 
86348BZ259 16 Union Turnpike Queens. Did the commissioner see the letter from the applicants late? For, I think it's Friday. Yeah. Um, yes. So I don't know why it's a brand new computer and it takes five minutes to save. So the little dial is going around and around and I can't move to the next one. I don't understand it's a brand new computer. I've tried so many different ways and I can't get it to. So the answer is I don't know what I think. There we go. All right. So, the, <laughs> so all right. So now, all right. I have it. Okay. Okay. Um, so the applicant and the owner submitted an adjournment request due to health issues, but the owner committed to repairing the sidewalk in the summer. Um, I think we can adjourn this until late July. So in terms of that, but I would like a letter sent to the owner because it seems like they're not the owner's not getting the instructions that the. Um, that the remaining issues need to be taken care of because I don't want to have them come back in July and they didn't know for some reason that, you know, they didn't listen to the instructions, they didn't anything. Do so, we, I'm what? sorry, Madam Chair, not to interrupt you. Do we want to copy the tenant because the tenant... No, so the tenant is apparently moving out. That's what the owner said in its letter, that it'll be easier for me once the tenant moves out. The lease expires, I think, in September or October. Some, well, something. So the, but the issue is the stucco wall was supposed to have been painted on both sides, the landscaping completed. So all of that needs to be completed by July because you can't then push off landscaping. Then that puts you into November again, right? And I don't want to keep, and so I don't want the excuse that they didn't hear. Um, I think Mr. Duarte may show, is probably going to show up tomorrow. Okay, well that would be good if he can do that so we can tell him, but I'm concerned that the owner isn't getting all of the instructions because the last time um, we got photographs shows showed the stucco only uh, painted on one side, not two sides, and the landscaping was not completed, so we had these open issues. I just want to uh, go back on the landscaping. Uh, I, I don't think we, I, in my notes, I don't see anything where we said we required landscaping. This is a section that was already con concrete around the lot, right? I have so remove weeds and sidewalks, restored curbs using DOT standards, approved plan shows that, that, that remove miscellaneous barriers, tire rack must be stored inside buildings provide photos of, of completed work taken inside and outside the site. There's graffiti, car lift must be kept on the interior. Right. Uh, oh, uh, that's reading old stuff. Um, yeah, uh, because they did not have any landscaping area even as part of the previously approved plan. And No, actually, Commissioner Otley Brown commented, landscaping and planters won't survive the winter. Right, because they had put planters out to address the landscaping issue. I did a site visit, if you're... Yeah, yeah, okay. There's an, a huge outdoor lift now that's been installed, like huge. Oh. It's been there then from my last site visit. That, oh, okay, that, yeah, that um, should be addressed. That was uh, in September. Okay. So let, let her finish, though. I want to hear the rest. So say it again. There is a, it's, it's very large, and it's outdoors. And there was actually a car on it when I went by. So they're doing repairs outdoors, which they're not supposed to be doing. And as I said, I saw that in my last site visit. That was in, back in September. So, so this is part of the problem of the owner not being. We asked the owner to come, and so well, the owner said he can't come because of health reasons. Issues. But there has to be somebody responsible for this site. You can't just and say. And according you know, to the applicant, when you and I spoke, and I reached out to the applicant, he said no one had uh, authority, no, no power of attorney, no one's representing the owner except him in this matter, and then the owner himself. So. I'm thinking maybe we need to make a call with counsel to the owner. They have to understand that this isn't a joke and you can't just keep ignoring our instructions like this. You should know? the letter specify that the owner needs to attend in late July? Yeah, okay. it should stay that or send, uh, send counsel with the authority to make decisions on your behalf. Um, it's a serious issue, something like that. That's why I want a letter from counsel's office 
giving clear instructions. And what we could do is to make sure that we don't um, suggest something that wasn't stated at the review sessions and hearings. We can listen to the videos and make sure that what we say is in the letter is accurately reflecting the, <coughs> the record. slow. Did you have something you wanted to add? Anybody else? No? Um, Let me know when you're ready. Okay. I don't understand what's wrong. Okay, go ahead. I'm afraid to save. <laughs> okay. Item number three, 2018 18BZ, 2228, 20, I'm sorry, 2228 to 2250 Linden Boulevard, Brooklyn. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, there was a statement in the last hearing that street tree planting was requested in 2018, but they didn't provide us any proof. And in the letter that um, we received for this hearing, it says uh, they called 311, but that doesn't do anything if you haven't filed for uh, so I, I looked into that request. Uh, the street tree request was filed with 311. It was closed by parks because the street tree request was to replace a tree in an existing tree pit, and parks did not find any existing tree pit. Uh, so the request was closed by no action of, uh, on behalf of the owner. Okay. And did, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, and I just want to, I tried to go on to request a street tree. I just wanted to see what that was like. And they said, due to some kind of something or other, you can no longer request it online. So I don't know what that means or how long that lasts. But um, so we can make it a condition again. But okay. it was a condition before, and they didn't do it. So. And no, we the still have to fire, fire department. department letter. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah we, just to, just like give us a chance to do our thing, okay? <laughs> sorry, sorry, Commissioner. We're still waiting on them addressing the fire department violations. The fire department. Now, fire department a issued a letter of no oh. objection, and um, I. And they confirmed that the nightclub has closed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the restaurant spa space is being renovated, so plans have been filed with regards to some of the range and other issues, so they mm -hmm. have no objection. How about uh, the trucks? The trucks issue? We, we so the trucks it. seem to be related to the plumbing supply company yes. that's on the site. So but why is that a bad thing for the trucks to be located on their own site? The, the white trucks are not related. I, I did check the Google views, the street views, and I believe the truck that is associated with the plumbing has a logo on it that says plumbing. But there are two other white trucks that were spotted in, in a, one of the Google views, and I'm not sure if these are related to the plumbing store. Well, they could be getting deliveries from other companies. It could be so many combinations of it. If they're related to the business, the way I see it is if these deliveries are happening related to the businesses, then we should encourage that operation to be happening on site rather than from the curb level. It uh, minimizes uh, uh, the, um, uh, the pedestrian and other traffic conflict. Mm -hmm. It contains it within the site. And the, they are indicating that there is adequate parking for customers to park in addition to truck parking. No, but so I think the issue is this is not a public parking lot. It's an accessory parking lot, right? So if the trucks are there related to business yes. activities, that's one thing. I think what we're trying to find out is whether they're using it essentially as an off-site public parking lot. I think that's what Commissioner Schiff was getting at. So. Um, Especially, especially, I, I read the response from the applicant to the drugs points, and I, he's, he was like swinging by the past traffic study that was submitted with the previous grant, and, and I, I didn't understand the relation between the trucks, the two trucks that were like apparent in one of the views, and, and the previous parking study. I was anticipating something that, yes, these trucks are related to the existing store, or no, they are not, will we'll, we'll eliminate these trucks from the site. Something, some, okay. some sort of a clear answer. Like so we need a clarification. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Okay. And then the photos show striping the site in better condition, um, which was one of the things we were concerned about the last time. Okay. Move on. Mm -hmm. New cases, item number 4764056BZ. 200-05 Forest Harding Expressway, this is being postponed. Right, so I just want to make sure that we send to Muriel, like right away tomorrow, the revised date so that he, notice goes out properly. Notice of hearing goes out properly, okay? It was on the vote sheet, but it was missed. And yeah, that's what I mean. So we send an email saying, please send a vote sheet immediately, I mean, a notice immediately tomorrow. Okay. Item number 5, 4297 BC, 9320 Astoria Boulevard, Queens. Um, we have proof of service of initial application and of notice of hearing to officials. We need community board. Um, we have fire department letter of no objection. Um, we need proof of continuous use since the variance expired in March of 2018 and the renewal wasn't requested until October 2019 as far as I can tell. Um, the site was largely rezoned to a C1-3 and the district boundary is measured 100 feet from and parallel to Astoria Boulevard. I'd like them to provide the dimension from the district boundary line to the edge of the property line, measuring perpendicular to the district boundary line to see whether section 77-11 legalizes the entire lot. It may be just 25 feet more in which case it legalizes the lot. Um, the dimensions on the site plan for the depth of property along 93, 93rd Street don't match the tax map, so I couldn't actually, they're dimensions of the building itself as opposed to the lot frontage, so then it, you couldn't tell from that information. The floor plans are um, flipped relative to the <coughs> site plan, so they should be flipped so that they're facing in the same direction as the site plan. The streets need to be labeled, um, showing onto which um, street the front doors open. It just says street, so you don't know which way is up. Um, with respect to the terms of the variance, I'd like to know what the provision is for closing the parking lot after hours. Um, and what about the baffling uh, of the HVAC rooftop equipment? These are all conditions to grant. And lighting away from the residents, they haven't shown that. Um, they need to provide photos of the landscaping in place. I can see that some is in place. It doesn't look like all is in place. Um, there's a notation on the existing plans for, quote, board on board fencing, unquote, along 94th Street, but photos show chain link on 94th and no fencing on Astoria. They should clarify that. Board on board is like uh, wood fencing that's solid. Um, also, they uh, should make clear on the drawings with better line weights and symbols the extent of the fencing versus the property line and so on. Um, and then they said that they're going to be replacing the street trees, so that would be assuming that the variance continues uh, condition. Anybody else? Um, the hours of operations were not provided. Um, similar commentary. You have to speak up into the mic. Sorry. Hours of operation uh, um, was not provided in the documents. Um, similar comments on the continuous use. Um, there are some rental drop-off boxes at the entrance um, to the handicap ramp. Need to ensure that it does not obstruct accessibility from what the. What kind of drop-off box? These are like the Netflix, Amazon, um, like. These are video drop-off um, boxes. Um, rent, like, I think it was a Netflix drop-off box. Um, so these are rental drop-off boxes at, at the entrance up to the handicap ramp and need to ensure that it does not obstruct access accessibility from the ramp or the ADA parking space. Anybody else? I just, uh, I think the elimination of term uh, argument's a bit undercut by the numerous DOB violations that they've acquired. Oh. But mm, I have to look at them. What's the nature of the DOB violations? Um, there are elevated devices. Um, say, say. It, I believe it's mostly related to the elevator. And there is an elevator. 
Isn't it a one-story building? Yeah. It's That's the thing is, you know, these elevator violations endure even though there's no building on the lot. Hmm. The, those are the crazy ones, right? And they even, because they fail to um, file a inspection. Right. So the only thing I can think of on this site is that there might be an elevator that goes into the cellar, right? But other than that, um, I don't know why there would be an elevator. It's a great elevator. There was also a question as to whether there were fines that have been paid or not with regards to those violations. Okay. They're signed. It should be broken out by frontage. And I saw on the site visit that the landscaping along the residential border is very sparse and definitely should be replanted. There definitely is not any elevator in the building. Is there a cellar? There is, but it's stairs. There's a hand-powered conveyor device at the site. Oh, okay. Well, that's, is that the same as an elevator? It, it's a voice. Uh, do you yeah. classify as all voices? Ah, okay. It's a hoist that would be a fixed hoist, or it's something you move around? Just curious. It's presumably what they use to get materials from the cellar to the ground floor. Mm -hmm. okay. It shows as a conveyor belt in the plans. And then one of the requests, which I don't really think is doable, is that we only, you know, most of the site is in, this, is in the commercial district now. So one of the requests is that the variance only applies to the little slivers that are in the R district, but we grant variances for the entire zoning lot, right? And it's very common where you have a zoning lot where the parking is in the R district, but the commercials and commercial building is in the commercial district, it still subjects the whole lot to review by the board. So the best would be for them to find out that 7711 um, applies or to come for that special permit that shifts the district boundary over. 25 feet. Yeah, so that's another way of doing it. But oh, but that only shifts it over by 25 feet, so you're still mm -hmm. stuck. Yeah, so as long as the at the widest point in the remainder of the zoning lot is less than 25 feet. But I don't know. If, yeah. But if it weren't, let's say it's 28 feet, the special permit would allow to extend it by 25 feet. That's it. Only 25, no, it doesn't actually help you, I don't think. It doesn't give you 50 feet. It only gives you 25, the special permit. 25, yeah, the special permit only allows 25 feet. Right, so it doesn't, it's not any different than being a pre-zoning map change land, uh, zoning lot that gets the 25 foot free. Yeah, only if 7711 weren't applicable. Right. Then at least you could oh, that's extend true. it by 25 yeah. feet. And just the remainder, if there is a remainder of the lot, it can't be used for the commercial purpose. So it would have to be something what, like planting. What's the special permit number? 7352. Something like that. Okay. It's a 25. 25. Okay. Either one. Yeah, five, five. I think it's 50. Yeah. Move on. Uh huh. Item number six, one sixty ninety eight BZ fifty seven seventy Highland Boulevard, Staten Island. Okay. We didn't have proper notice of hearing for the last hearing in January, but now we have it. Um, we do have proof of service of initial application to officials. Um, the proposed and approved um, appear to match. So the, and the site looks looks good to me from photos anyway. Um, we do have fire department letter of no objection. Um, the landscaping is mostly intact. It's missing the arbor, the missing arbor, arbor vitae should be infilled 
and plants should show specific tree type and count. Um, and I have a note that Commissioner Otley Brown had comments on this the, the last time. Do you want to read yours? Yes, um, that this was, I believe this was previously a Richmond County Bank, but is now a New York Community Bank. Mm -hmm. And um, the signage changed to note it, but the existing and proposed plans still show the Richmond County Bank signs. And then also the signage is broken down by frontage, but should be further broken down by illuminated slash non-illuminated to show compliance with the maximum illuminated signage per frontage. Okay. Anybody else on this one? No? Okay. Let me know when you're ready. It's a reflex to hit save. Same. My desktop. I've never seen that before. Let Steve take a look at it. Yeah, it's wrong. It's not right. Okay. Ready? All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Appeals calendar. Continued hearing items. Item number seven, 2016-4302A through 2016-4326A, Cupidity in Avedita Stat Place, Staten Island, item number eight, 2016-4355A through 2016-4462A, Fort Brary Lane, Avedita Place and Cupidity Drive, item number nine, 2017-107A through 129A, Fort Brary Lane, Avedita Place and Cupidity Drive, and number 10, item, um, sorry, item number 10, 2019-51A through 2019-57A, same address as Horbier Lane, Avita Place, Avita Place and Cupidity Drive, Staten Island. Okay, the last hearing we had on this was in November, November 19th, and subsequently, um, Borough President Otto submitted a voluminous report on that office's experience with developments that are located on streets that were never properly mapped. The emails and letters to city agencies are particularly interesting in this document in describing the confusion and wasted energies involved in attempting to clarify the status of these streets, whether CCO or otherwise. There is no question in my mind that from an administrative perspective alone, completely independent of issues having to do with fire safety and maintenance, the unmapped street situation is in a state of utter chaos and unfitting to the stature of the world-class city of New York. The letters and emails also remind us that the story of the Department of Sanitation's refusal to pick up the trash on a private street in Queens is not an isolated condition. Based on these letters, the absence of Department of Sanitation snow plowing and trash pickup on some private streets plagues Staten Island as well. Several email exchanges with constituents um, and the borough president's office um, and other agencies explain so well the issue of the abandoned, unfunded homeowners associations and the reality that they cannot be relied upon to maintain the unmapped streets. Even the fire hydrants lack reliable upkeep. All of this by way of saying that the city has to change its operations, in my opinion. City planning has to map the city streets. The city has to either take title to them, dedicate them as in public use, or acknowledge that a privately owned map street must be maintained by city agencies, even if it means also obtaining performance bonds, additional fees, and insurance from the owners of these privately owned map streets. All of this is outside of BSA's domain and, um, yeah, it's outside of its domain and authority. The applicant submitted slightly revised plans and other documents that would be relevant if it were not for the fact that there is no hardship or practical difficulty here. The applicant can and should go to city planning for a mapping action. Applicant argues that the materials submitted by the borough president point to a mere minority of incidents and inconveniences associated with these unmapped streets. But that has not been my experience while at the BSA. Indeed, I have frequently asked for proof 
that the property owner requesting a GCL 36 waiver has the right of passage over the unmapped privately owned roadways and have been told that there are no deeds of record for the roadway, that nobody owns them, that the HOA is long defunct, um, never existed, can't be resurrected, etc. We've seen so many of these situations at the BSA leading to my conclusion that it is the rule, not the exception. Applicant argues that, the, that city planning doesn't have to map and nothing in the city charter or the GCL requires that it do so. I certainly disagree with that interpretation. GCL 36 paragraph 2 requires that all buildings front on map streets. GCL 34 prohibits plots of land showing lots, blocks, or sites from being recorded at the county clerk's office without approval by a planning board empowered to approve such plats. GCL 33 mandates strict standards for approval of plats showing lots, blocks, and sites with or without streets. How are such blocks and plats approved? GCL 32 states that that duty would be placed in the hands of the city planning department. The city charter empowers the planning department to map subdivisions or plots of land into streets. It does not empower BSA to do that. This application effectively asks BSA to approve subdivisions, plats, and blocks. Blocks. We don't have that authority. GCL 29 authorizes the city's legislative body working in tandem with the planning department to lay out new streets. The city charter empowers the city planning commission to map the streets. The charter does not empower the BSA to do that. BSA's sole authority is to waive GCL 36 paragraph 2 requirements in the event that practical difficulty or unnecessary hardship exists and where the circumstances of the case do not require the structure to be related to existing or proposed streets or highways has been demonstrated. This has not been demonstrated here. A building that doesn't need access to a street is an accessory building, not an, not an entire housing development. And it isn't as if city planning doesn't conduct and hasn't conducted mapping actions. There have been dozens, if not hundreds, of mapping actions over the last 20 years to map, demap, create parks, widen roadways, etc. This data is easily searchable on city planning's website for MM ULERP actions. Even Staten Island has had mapping actions, one as recently as 2017 or the 2013 establishment of Englewood and Tyrellian Avenues and Bricktown Way for a commercial development. Um, this is all in um, to respond to applicants' comment that the city hasn't mapped a private action in 40 years or something like that. Those, well, those were private actions. That the city has a mess before it in Staten Island, as admitted by DOT's commissioner, does not mean that it should continue to exacerbate the chaos by refusing to plan. And so uh, that's my comments on this. We also have a letter of objection from the Department of Environmental Protection. Other comments? Okay. Um, yeah, the applicant had stated in its latest submission uh, that um, you know the the reason they're proposing the layout specific to the fingerboard was to avoid multiple uh, vehicular curb cuts. I don't think we at any point at the last hearing had suggested m a multiple vehicular curb, curb cuts from fingerboard. What we had recommended was activating the fingerboard road by having the buildings face, um, face fingerboard and having some kind of an entrance, and that could be a pedestrian entrance. It doesn't have to be a vehicular entrance. I, I'm just kind of, there are many solutions to addressing some of these things. But that's just a minor issue. The bigger picture is that, as I've stated in my earlier, um, yeah, at, at earlier hearings, that unlike some of the other GCL 36, like Teresio, Nello, and Tapulo, that have undergone planning review by the uh, Dep uh, city's uh, Department of City Planning, a project of this magnitude needs to be designed and reviewed by applicable city agencies um, and developed in a way that will benefit both the occupants of the subject site and the neighborhood. 
My concern with this project is that there is no mechanism for BSA to determine whether the existing infrastructure can support the future development and whether the site plan will create potential traffic circulation in the abut abutting street network. Other comments? I'm not recognizing the hardship here. I believe I said that before because it's clear that the available floor area could actually be developed as of right at this site. Yeah, I, I agree with all what is said so far. I, I don't believe that we have a like a clear hardship argument here. In addition, that I believe the design of the site is, is way, very complicated. I realize that especially after the submission of the survey during this submission. So I, I, I believe we should like put this case to rest tomorrow and not let it drag us for other for another like three hearings or so. So yeah, for me it's not a secret that since I became a member of this board, uh, I've had strong objection to the application of the GCL thirty six in a way that uh, I believe is both inconsistent with the law and inconsistent um, and, and has wreaked havoc on the people of Staten Island. As a lawyer, it's patently evident by reading the statute and the supporting case law that the GCL 36 is a purposely narrow written legislation, which supported, but which supporting case law confirms is to be used only in very specific type of cases in a very specific kind of way. It used to be a relief for an applicant who has such a small project that it would be unjust to have them go through a mapping action. In essence, the project has to be so trivial that there is no need for extensive planning and that a quick review would determine the appropriateness of the waiver. And that an expenditure, an expenditure of a mapping action it's, is so unnecessary that it would be unjust for such a small property owner with such a small ass to be required to adhere to it. That's not the case here. And frankly, it's not even close. But before I get into why it's not close, like as a Staten Islander, I've personally seen, uh, witnessed just the havoc, the destruction this has had on, on the people of Staten Island. Um, and, and while I, I thought that I had a really good grasp on it, it wasn't until I came to the BSA and I heard all of the, um, uh, the, the complaints of, of several of the, uh, um, several of the, of the people in the community that I, I got to really understand the extensiveness. Um, I think it's important that we, uh, we, we, we really consider the, the opus that Jimmy Otto submitted before this record um, and, and also the hard work he has, he's done to address this, this, this scourge of the GCL 36s on Staten Island. And, and alongside, uh, Michael Kuzik, um, the Assemblyman, Max Rose, Debbie Rose, Diane Savino, all of these people who, who uh, submitted on behalf of the people of Staten Island uh, and echoed the complaints of the people of Staten Island um, and also echoed the complaints of, of the fire department who is helpless to enforce the haphazard parking that plagues these streets because they're unable to give tickets for cars blocking necessary fire lanes, creating extremely dangerous conditions where several families' lives can be in danger due to what is fundamentally a wild west of zoning. Um, the, even if we weren't going to look at the 90 residents that this application wants to hide, uh, despite it being in the zoning lot, as if they're putting a curtain over it, as if they were the Wizard of Oz, saying it's not your concern, um, it's not part of the, they say it's not part of the application. We're not a planning board, and they're right. We're not a planning board. Uh, and the fact that, that they think that we should ignore it is more of a reason why it should be before a planning board. Um, but even if we're ignoring these, these units do not tip the scale uh, of this project in any way. They, there's no litmus test. This is way outside of any litmus test of a GCL 36. <coughs> we have well over a hundred families that should be entitled to proper planning to ensure their safety and the safety of their streets and the safety of their property. And it's disingenuous for this applicant to claim that the specifically tailored type of review that was done by other agencies is actually cons considered a full review of their application. Because we all know that's not the case. Uh, city planning is reviewing whether or not a lot of subdivision is appropriate, not whether or not this whole project is, is properly planned. This, this project never went through city planning review. This is only a DOB -E review project. Never went project. to city planning. Oh, it's right. only, it only goes to city planning if it's in the special mm -hmm. district, and it's not. 
anything soon. Um, but in any event, uh, claiming that the argument that if this project were to go through the proper process would be a taking is a non sequitur. Um, they, they haven't stated a, a hardship or practical difficulty that, that it, it, the, the owner simply wants to circumvent the rules and get a bonus floor area because they will count these streets as part of the lot and get to build way more than their neighbors could. It's not a hardship that this developer prefers to build this rather than something else which is viable. This is a massive project in every aspect. Um, they have no way of guaranteeing that the, the that they can address now or in the futures that ambulances will be able to find the houses on this lot, that the street trees are inspected, that the fire hydrants are tested, that the cars that cars won't block fire truck lanes. Uh, I just don't see how um, a GCL 36 would be appropriate in this application. Item number 11, 2017, 16A through 2017, 19A, 1558, 62, Clintonville Street and 150, 93, 95, Clintonville Court, Queens. And item number 12, 2018, 105A, 150, 87, Clintonville Court, Queens. Okay, so um, this has been around for a little while and it's now, for me, it's become a tricky case in light of our decision in Mello. Um, since the as of right allows for, according to the applicant, development of three houses, admittedly large ones, but then many of the houses in the land use study that was provided are not using their full allowable FAR, so the as of right houses could be smaller. In it, and actually, in an R3-1, a two-family semi-detached residence is permitted um, to be built on smaller lots, 31, 35 square foot lots, with minimum dimensions of 33 feet instead of 40. So um, th that actually allows for four two-family semi-detached houses based on a frontage of 157 and a half feet, or one two-family detached and three two-family semi-detached. So it's actually four houses. Um, Furthermore, the depth of the two lots to the north fronting Clintonville are the same as their neighbors to the north that have single houses on them. And the vast majority of the building typologies on the block are back-to-back -back facing Clintonville and 150th place. The configuration proposed also doesn't provide adequate turnaround space for cars or emergency vehicles in a cul-de-sac but rather just dead ends into the house at the back. I acknowledge that fire department signed off on the project finally because an access easement and sprinklers are to be provided, but there's not, normally you would see a cul-de-sac in a, in a layout like this, so at least houses could, I mean, cars could easily continue around and out, and it doesn't have that. Um, in looking closer at the situation of this lot and the GCL 35 waiver request that's traveling along this, I note that there's lot 32 in block 4699 at the rear of the site, um, which, is part, which is part of the map street of uh, 16th, I guess 16th Road. Um, that, um, and when I look that up on ACRIS, unlike the sites in question, there's no recording data, no data recorded against it at all. So that leads me to believe that it's probably city owned, a little piece of city owned land on a map street. So I ask, 
why not access the rear of the site from a map street that only has to be opened, in, in other words, improved a very short distance, like less than a driveway's distance to reach the property. It's like seven, between 60 something and 75 feet. Um, the, so so I, I really think they should be looking at that. And this goes back to what I said at the, for the prior um, application, the subject of looking up who owns these pieces of property when the answer is no one. When it's no one, I think that means it belongs to the city, you know? If nobody claims it, I, I don't actually know how it works, but you have the city taking an action to map a street and no record against this property since at least 1961, because that's as far back as ACRIS goes, right? So chasing the ownership might find that the city took title at some point or other, and that doesn't appear, we never find city title unless it's a foreclosure action, right? So um, also, they provided a builder's pavement plan, which shows a curb cut and passage over the sidewalk to get to Clintonville Court as if it were a driveway. But meanwhile, it's serving, um, I think it's three houses up there. So it's not really a driveway, it's a street, right? So I'm curious whether that's the proper entry to three two-family houses on an unmapped street. This reminds me a little bit of Dunton Court, um, where you went over a curb, an actual curb, to get to Dunton Court that was servicing, I don't know, 50 houses, yeah. right? And so that doesn't seem like the right way to handle, assuming you know we are okay with a GCL 36, it doesn't seem like the right way to handle what's effectively a street. Um, and if it, if it went over a sidewalk, it means that the city is never going to declare it as in use, right? Because it looks like a private driveway. Um, so, but in the meantime, and I do have to compliment the applicant for really doing excellent work on this. I'm, I'm, you know, I know it's been very hard. I know there's lots of restrictive declarations that had to be prepared because the fire department also and the buildings department had requirements for an access easement um, and so on. So I believe we have all of the restrictive decks in the access agreements in order. Um, so there isn't any kind of more legal stuff to do. Um, and fire department provided a conditional sign off which uh, includes the recording of that access easement. So for, for me, the, the tricky part is either in light of Nello, you can develop four houses on this lot with frontage and maybe you can develop all of them which would be just a better solution from a design perspective right up from a map street on a map street very short distance from 150th right into the property. I don't think you would need more than GCL 35s in that case. So, um, and I'm sorry I didn't catch that earlier. Okay, anybody else? No? Okay. Move on. Mm -hmm. Zoning calendar, continued hearing items, item number 13, 2017, 56 BZ, 1321 Richmond Road, Staten Island. Okay. Um, a fairly minimal submission was made with the promise to submit in the next round more information on supportive excavation and financial analyses for the three unit project. A set of drawings for the three unit project was provided, however. Um, I think we, we warned at the last hearing that that would be the last round. I think we've been at this too long and we now have drawings that we can vote on. Um, at the last hearing, the instruction was to reduce the scope of the waiver to three units. This has been done. The drawings are for three units. Um, so with the exception of the use waiver to allow a three unit rather than a one family and a front yard waiver which reduces the yard to 13 foot 10 inches instead of the required 20 feet, the project otherwise complies with all other bulk regulations that would apply to a one family house. As to the front yard waiver, we asked the applicant, we asked the applicant to pull the house forward and modify the configuration of the house to reduce the impact on the slope. So that's actually something that we requested. Um, we also asked the applicant to design the project with 
a step system, which I'm not going to say correctly because I'm not an engineer, but, um, and I know that Commissioner um, Chetta had a slight change on how to express this, but we asked the, um, the, des the applicant to design the project with a step, step system rather than a 40-foot retaining wall, which reduced the costs and apparent height of the building and also its impact on the hill itself and consequently minimizes the impact on the stability of the adjacent properties. Um, neighbors were very concerned about what the 40 foot high retaining wall would be doing to them and so using a stepping system would reduce that kind of um, fear of slide. Um, so I, and I think that given that the original ask was for a six unit, three story plus above grade cellar, 10 parking space, 2,400 square foot floor plate, this three unit, more or less 1,900 square foot floor plate with six accessory parking spaces brings the project to the minimum variance necessary to afford relief from the costs associated with developing a project on this steep slope. Other comment? Anybody else? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I just want to clarify about the, the stepping thing. The, first of all, the, the only reason, in my opinion, that we are granting something on this case is because of the steep slope. And the treatment that should be implemented for that steep slope during the excavation and foundation and installation for any proposed development on this side. Even if BSA, and I want to make this crystal clear, even if BSA does not grant something on this, a variance on this, during the excavation and foundation installation, it should be it should be a like very careful treatment and construction procedure followed to safely construct any proposed development that could implement excavation on that steep slope. Mm -hmm. So we're granting something, and the only reason for granting this is we assume that the applicant will implement the right excavation support, <coughs> which in my opinion should be a step slash benched excavation that need to be utilized rather than the 40 feet deep cut. So instead of going this sudden cut of 40 feet high, it should be a step and bench excavation. We're not dictating what kind of excavation support should could be implemented. We're not dictating what kind of configuration for that bench or step excavation that the applicant need to follow. This is the job of the applicant's engineer. And 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 again, the, there is there is a variance here, and there is a price from the applicant side that should be paid which is please install safe and appropriate excavation system during construction. It, I believe that any grant here should be conditioned on, on the fact that the applicant will do so, will follow that. And I believe this grant should be voided if the applicant doesn't do so, doesn't design and construct the needed excavation support system that makes the adjacent properties stable and safe during the construction. Because if he doesn't do so, he does not deserve a variance. Okay. Done? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was just, the, yeah. the chair's considering voting on this to, tomorrow, even though yeah. they haven't submitted their financials. Now, so at the last hearing, we said, and I don't want to put words into Commissioner we got, Brown. We got what? financial for four units before. We looked at them. We looked at the implemented cost for the support excavation. I believe that it was exaggerated because of the use of the 40 feet tall, 6 feet thick, 20 feet wide footing, all that kind of exaggeration in the retaining wall. And actually, it's not exaggeration. Like I asked the engineer for the project during the last hearing. How many times did you construct a 40 feet tall uh, retaining wall for a house? And he said, actually, I'm, I'm not mentioning the exact wording, but he said not in his professional career. So the, the reason for the cost was exaggerated for the previous submission was 
in my opinion, because of the use of that inappropriate excavation support system, which is a retaining wall that's very massive. Based on my evaluations, looking at the cost submitted before, I believe with three units, and again, with the implementation of an appropriate excavation support that stabilizes all the adjacent properties, rock masses, soil masses, everything, three units would be okay. Three units would be justified. Yes, would be justified, yes. Okay. But if they elect to go with with flimsy excavation support system or a minimal one, like I said during the last hearing, I advised the applicant to be prepared for issues. And if if issues arise on this side because of the use of the excavation support and it's concluded that the excavation support was not appropriate, I strongly believe that we should void our grant. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm asking for a condition on this grant. But Good. Commissioner Otley Brown, at the last hearing, if I remember, the direction was to go down to three because it seemed that four was not being supported by the recommendation from Commissioner Shetta. Is that? If Commissioner Shetta said that the costs were amplified, then there would be no reason to have four. Mm -hmm. And I would say on this on this project, honestly, I did something that I never done on any of the cases that I got to the BSA. I actually did like design the site, work on the side grades, proposed what is the optimum proposed side grades could be, how how the stepping of the retaining walls could be configured to minimize the impact of the anticipated rock slash soil cuts on the adjacent properties. So of course I did this, but I'm not going to give it to the applicant. The applicant job here is to hire somebody who is experienced to work on an excavation support system that, number one, and this is number one, not number two, number one, to stabilize the adjacent properties and make sure that nothing happened during construction. Number two is cost effective. Yes, it's an easy job to go with that very massive retaining wall, but I'm, I'm telling them, and I told them last hearing, even if you elect to go with that six feet thick retaining wall, it's gonna do nothing, because during excavation, you have to cut this 40 feet tall rock cut, and if you do so, it's gonna be a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, who's gonna, commission. Uh, my, my question is, if we put that as a condition, who's going to ensure that, that Believe me, the neighbors DOB. are watching. <laughs> yeah, DOB. The D, well, DOB with the neighbors watching by doing regular yeah. inspections. Yep. You, you know that they'll be watching. I assume they'll also hire their own engineers, which is typically what you do as a neighbor who's afraid about what's going on next door. Um, you know, we don't watch, but other professionals and Department of Buildings when they get 311 complaints. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if DUB is listening to us, but in this specific case, I'm not sure if this is possible to put something in our resolution that DUB takes the excavation support for this project and similar projects mm -hmm. that actually include significant disturbance to slopes like that. Mm -hmm. If we can take this excavation support system and like forward to their excavation unit, we have an excavation unit right. in place and have somebody carefully, carefully to look at this. Right, so so we can alert in our resolution and in a phone call to DOB about the concerns on this project, but obviously we can't affect how DOB do, operates in general. Yeah, I totally right. understand. Right. I'm yeah. not, I'm okay. not. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? Mm -hmm. Item number 14, 2018-67 BZ, 7406 Fifth Avenue, Brooklyn. We're requesting an adjournment. Yes, um, but I also have notes on that. So at the hearing in October, in response to a request for adjournment, we said, um, quote, adjournment requested this application to legalize an existing addition has been lingering since its initial submission in May of 2018. The applicant needs to move it along or it will be dismissed. So I don't understand what's holding this up. 
applicant's counsel should appear and explain what it means by, quote, diligently prosecuting the application. Um, and um, and the issues, explain what the issues with the tenant are that are described in the letter. The downstairs, there's a, a spa sort of place downstairs. Right, so they need not to. not legalized and. So then what are they doing? Never legalizing it? Like, what are to they get, doing? They said they're trying to get them out, but as far as I see, when I walked past last week, it's, it was still there. So I don't, I don't understand. That, that's not diligently prosecuting anything. Uh, that's just there. letting the status quo continue. So um, I don't agree to the adjournment. Um, they have to appear. It's just been here for since May, submitted May 2018. It's almost two years. Item number 15, 2018-171-BZ, 1 East 70th Street, Manhattan. Okay, sorry. Oh, we got this. Yeah. Sorry. Tons of notes. All right. Um, the last two hearings were adjourned since we were waiting for environmental sign-offs from involved agencies. We now have those sign-offs. Um, since the September 17th hearing that we had last, we had a 10, um, an October 30th submission from Opposition Council concerning environmental review and several new letters in support in opposition to the project. Um, so uh, that's just to update everybody about what was received and for the public to know what, that we're aware of those submissions. We received plans today and a revised EAS. The plans have the notes from uh, the interagency letters. Sorry, the plans what? Have notes from the interagency letters. Okay, so in other words, the agencies requiring certain things be done yeah. appears on the drawings. Yes, but they were submitted this morning. Right, okay, yes. but they're bubbled so we can find them, I hope. Um, the plan submitted Friday were bubbled, but these weren't. But my understanding is the only change is the notes. No, we need them to, they need Two to be bubbled, bubbled or we can't okay. find the changes. It's assuming that we know what was there and what wasn't okay. there. So please may have them resubmit bubble okay. drawings. That's a standard. I, I sh shouldn't have to ask for that, actually. I think they're done. We'll, okay. we'll take a look at it. Okay. <coughs> Move on? Yeah. Item number 16, 2018, 170, uh, 2018, 172BZ, 4609, 4619, 31st Avenue, Queens. Thank you. Okay. I just want to Sorry. 46, okay. Um. Okay, I just want to clarify the record because I was a little disturbed by some of the submissions that we had from um, neighbors. Um, for the record, in reading some of the letters from neighbors that were submitted immediately following the January 28th um, hearing, one neighbor at 3090 47th Street states that she didn't receive notice of our initial October 3rd hearing. Um, because the BSA takes these notices very seriously, we keep records of them and we require the applicant submit proof of notice to us and we check those notices prior to holding the hearing to make sure that notice was properly served. Um, the notice to that neighbor was sent out by certified mail and proof of receipt was signed by that person on September 14, 2019. We have proof of notice having been received by many other immediate neighbors as well, some of whom may have signed onto another letter complaining that they didn't receive notice. That, that letter didn't specify the addresses of the senders. Um, and I reiterate that we take notice very, very seriously. And I also take seriously misrepresentation by anyone um, in these hearings. So notice was indeed received uh, in September prior to our first hearing. Um, 
Two independent drawings, um, standalone drawings, were provided by the applicant without the rest of the drawing set. We need a complete set of drawings submitted all at once. Um, but as long as they're um, putting that together, they need to ensure the following, because I notice mistakes, um, that the rear yard requirement for the interior lot portion, floor areas, setbacks, et cetera, are correctly stated on all of the zoning charts and the BSA calculation sheet that the dimensions match among every drawing. For example, the rear yard dimensions are different everywhere. Um, the total floor area on the chart is missing. Um, the church um, is missing the church floor area, and since it's all on one zoning lot, it has to include the church. Um, that all the yards and setbacks and heights are dimensioned and coordinated throughout the set. So it's really not a coordinated set and the dimensions are all over the place, so I consider that a quite a messy set. And we, we couldn't close this out until it was a <coughs> coordinated set. There's also, there's an operational plan that mostly discusses trash protocols to be implemented for the program at the church. So I'd like to understand where is the trash currently stored? It should be stored on the grounds in an enclosure, ideally inside the building until it is brought to the street. And I'd like to understand what's the plan for trash management for the church building once the building, the new building is built, uh, because uh, presumably they're going to be doing something else. The new building has a trash compactor in the cellar. Um, so, you know, the community was very upset about the handling of the trash. There's a recent image capture, which I assume was submitted there by a neighbor, um, an image capture on Google showing unmanaged trash and debris on the sidewalk. There are also other images on Google in the time, sort of that time warp, whatever it is that thing it's called, um, that are um, of clean sidewalks and trash containers stored within the church gates. So it kind of depends on which day you take the picture. I think the protocol, rather than merely calling 311, is, which is suggested, should include removal and or reorganization of the sidewalk trash when it sits there on a no pickup day. So if it's, um, if it's I, I don't know whether, the, the implication is that the trash is being left by others, but you're responsible for your own sidewalk. That's why you get tickets, right? So if someone's leaving trash on your sidewalk, it's your job to organize the trash. So the bad news is if someone's using your frontage for dumping, you have to take care of it. You can't just say it's not my problem. So they have to incorporate that um, into their protocol. Um, the organization must have a superintendent to take care of the grounds and public spaces around them. The 311 call by someone inside the building is just not gonna cut it, especially it's just wrong. Um, in terms of concerns about loitering that were exp expressed by the community, of course there's nothing you can do about um, people from, from the residents or the church hanging out someplace down the street. There's nothing that you can do about that. But in front of the building, they must have someone on site who can ensure that none of their members or residents are hanging out on the sidewalk in front of the property or in front of the adjacent homes. That much you can recognize and they can't just say that they're going to lecture the residents not to do that they have to have someone who prevents that from happening um, and we did get an updated uh, objection from DOB to just add something about distance between windows um, and I think that was it that's all anybody else I just want to add to the loitering issue. Um, there are um, several other um, uses that are frequented by similar youth population, uh, I mean age population. There is a hostel across the street. There is a public school which have operation activities, after school activities. So. Uh, you mean in the neighborhood? In the neighborhood, in the immediate neighborhood. So it is very difficult to say that this particular person, right. it belongs to this particular program. And so I think we need to be, um, uh, yes, we, they, and I'm sure this organization 
very strictly monitors its residents, and that is one of their programs, is to make sure that the <coughs> residents um, coexist um, in the neighborhood so that they can assimilate into the neighborhood. That is one of the uh, programmatic elements of this organization. So I'm sure they're very diligent and, and will do so, and we, we encourage them to continue to do that. And I just kind of wanted to yeah. state well, that. I, I think it's going to be better once they get their program in place, because right now it's more tra it's more of a transient, a transient as opposed yeah. to a real living facility. But my, I, I'm not under the impression that they're going to stop the program that's in the church. So they have a transient program in the church. Maybe we could get clarification tomorrow, but I'm not under the impression that they discontinue that program. This is permanent housing, which is a completely different thing. Um, um, it's a completely different thing, and so we could get clarity on whether they're sure. still going to operate, but I, I just want to say that it's if you have a manager on site who is aware of these are my, you know, these are members of my organization. Then I, you can monitor those members and say, please don't hang out, or if you're going to hang out, please come back inside, that kind of thing. That way the organization can be sort of guilt-free and say, you know what, we have a program in place, here's our protocol. You see regularly our manager comes outside and has the the kids or whatever come back inside, right? So now you can easily say that the lawyers, such as there are any, come from another place, right? And then the neighbors can focus away from this place, knowing that it's well managed. But at the moment, it, it's not giving the impression that it's well managed. Whether or not that's the case, it's obviously the impression that the neighbors have, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the management needs to be more sort of visible on the street, I think. Okay. Do the commissioners want the operational plan updated to include the superintendent and the yes. resident? Yeah, and the, the whole protocol needs to be updated to improve, not just calling 311 for the trash, not just giving a lecture to the residents or the members that please don't loiter because that just all things in enough. Um, and you know, in terms of this thing, if you think about what it's like to go to school, school kids hang out on the stoops and everything around a school is just kind of normal. And then it's up to the school to handle the block and make sure the kids don't hang out there. It's, it's a similar thing. You know. Okay. Item number 17. 2019 6BZ 138 East 39th Street, Brooklyn, uh, Manhattan. Okay. Um, the cover letter indicates changes have been made to the statement of facts, but at the last hearing we stated that the drawings were not internally consistent. We also said P1 zoning calculations and BSA zoning calculation sheet were incorrect. I didn't see any mention of their being cleaned up here. No BSA calculation sheet was provided. The sheet submitted prior to the December hearing on November, November 20th matches the drawings provided now, but shows only four stories, not five. I stated at the last hearing that the R8B community facility rules may be different than those shown on the zoning sheet, and they are. That was a direction to check them. That wasn't done. The citation, and I just name a few of the mistakes that I picked up, but you know, the direction was go redo this. Um, the citation to section 24 33 is incorrect for lot coverage. It should be 24 11 for a maximum lot coverage of 70%. Section 24 12 allows coverage up to 23 feet in height above curb level. The citation to 24-522 for height is also incorrect. It should be section 24-011, which makes section 23-622 applicable, and the maximum allowable wall height should be 65 feet, and a maximum height should be 75 feet in an R8B, not 85 feet. The board shouldn't have to do this work for the applicant, and I'm frankly annoyed that we gave them the instructions and they ignored it or chose to answer only what they chose to answer. 
Um, there's also something confusing in the chart in the statement of facts versus the floor plans. The chart indicates that the fourth and fifth floors are to be constructed, as do the fourth and fifth floor plans, while the section indicates the fourth floor is existing and only the fifth floor is new, which is consistent with the statement in the statement of facts. Which is it? Very confusing. <coughs> This confusion was discussed at prior hearings, and the statement of fact still says that the prior variance was for an enlargement of the first floor, though never constructed, whereas this application is for an enlargement of the second floor. So this confusion is explained somewhat, um, but and too late, in the section that discusses the intent to raise the cellar ceiling or in the basement floor to raise. <coughs> But none of that's tied back to the discussion about the proposal. Um, so, uh, and there's a confusing portion in the discussion about the rear yard extensions impacts on neighbors that describes both, quote, both a full one story enlargement and a partial second story enlargement, unquote. The proposal is for a full second story enlargement and the first floor is existing. Confusing again. The result, this is the result of not reading the entire submission before submitting it. This is called sloppy, sloppy work. Um, and I'd have to say that it's a shame that for such a simple case we have to keep going back and forth because of the sloppy work of the owner's consultants. I don't really have any tolerance for that kind of submission. And I have to reiterate, as I did at the last hearings, the basis of a variance for religious institutions and schools is not programmatic needs. It is the deference doctrine established in the New York Court of Appeals case of Cornell v. Bagnardi. So the statement in the statement of facts at page 9 that the board has granted various variances based on programmatic needs is incorrect. Analysis, the analysis of the program, once Cornell deference or a unique physical condition has been established, goes to determining the minimum variance. <coughs> Statement of facts findings still describes this as a school at page 12. Um, it just goes on and on. It's just a mess. Um, they need to show the materials that are proposed on the elevations because it kind of looks like they're going to be recladding the exterior of the existing structure. And of course, absolutely no exterior insulation um, system to be used. Uh, and they need to provide side elevations to the extent that the building is higher than the adjoining properties. I think it rises <laughs> one floor higher um, than adjoining properties. Um, other comments? No? Move on? Yeah. Item number 18, 2019, 7BZ, 3341 Country Club, The Road, The Bronx. Okay. Um, uh, to clarify on the threshold question for this special permit, which applies only to colleges and universities, Fordham University is now the owner of the property, and we have a revised owner's authorization form to reflect it. The site plan was revised to show stockade fencing in some areas, but the key on the drawing is not clear at all about what the extent of the new fencing is versus the existing walls and so on. Um, they should clarify this. Uh, clarify the material also of the stockade fencing. I, I never really understand why the drawings have so much trouble identifying fencing. It's pretty easy to identify. Usually it's like a line with an X, a line with an X, and you do it bold enough so you can see it, and then it's very clearly separated from the property line. Um, the applicant needs to submit the entire set of drawings at one time, not just the site plan. Um, and all of the drawings need to be dated, most recent date. Um, an EAS was submitted on January 22nd and a phase one on January 27th, so it's now going through environmental review, so we can't <coughs> do this. Um, we also have WRP um, waterfront um, comments and DEP comments. LPC signed off on archaeological significance. Uh, I would like some sign from DEC, I'm not sure if we can get it, that it's okay to move forward with this absent their approval of the peers. So, um, because obviously this is really DEC and maybe even Army Corps, I think it is Army Corps domain. We stated at the last hearing that our approval is conditioned on obtaining all state and federal permits. 
but I want to just make sure DEC is okay if we could just ask them. Um, and that's my comments. Anybody else? Okay. Oops. Sorry. Twenty nine item number nineteen twenty nineteen dash nine BC four sixty eight Targi Street, Staten Island. Okay. All right. The as of right provided is three stories and uses all of the allowable floor area without showing. Um, as the proposed three-story does, whether it is taking advantage of mechanical and parking space reductions. Um, so I'm questioning, um, this is what was provided now, I'm questioning whether we have an actual hardship posed by the triangular lot, because it does use all of its floor area. Granted, it's a little bit funny shape. Um, on the question of self-created uh, hardship, sorry, um, Applicant provided a 1928 deed with the same meets and bounds as the subject triangular lot and a 1917 Bromley map that shows the same configuration of the same lot, which is number uh, lot number 73. <coughs> the map shows that lot 70 adjacent was later subdivided into lot 70 and 71. However, um, I don't think the applicant understands the task before it. Um, to determine whether the property has been held in common ownership and whether its decision to sell off a parcel has created the hardship complained of. The argument in the cover letter and accompanying BSA decision about zoning lot formations is not the question that was asked. Um, as we have said many times in these kinds of situations, where you have small lots applying for variances, when you look at whether the site is unique, you look to similarly sized lots and discount the ones held in common ownership with adjoining lots, whether or not they are being treated as one or more zoning lots. The fact of being a zoning lot is irrelevant to the question. The issue is only, could that owner expand the building on the occupied lot onto the vacant lot or build a bigger building straddling both lots or take advantage of the added lot area for parking and storage. Applicants own uniqueness study did exactly that, excluding from its study the lots that suffer hardship, those lots quote, owned together or quote, used as side yard for home on adjacent lot or quote, owned with adjacent lot I or H, et cetera, et cetera. Out of the 19 vacant lots listed in that study, 13 lots are excluded since they're held in common ownership with a neighbor. So the question in this case is, if the subject lot was held in common ownership with the neighboring lot and was subsequently sold off for development, was the hardship complained of self-created? And we have had a few cases where the applicant was able to prove that it wouldn't have mattered whether the lots were together or separate because they couldn't have been developed. That's, those are usually the way you kind of prove your way out of that situation. So we, I remember we had one kind of bow tie shaped lot. <coughs> and we had another one where the lot was also a really weird shape. You couldn't have developed them together and you couldn't have developed them apart. That's what you have to establish in that situation. Um, there is a ZRD1 um, dated January 13, 2020, indicating DOB's denial of the request to rebuild the existing house under Section 5441. Um, I'd like to um, have the wording in the ZRD1 verified, so in other words, uh, perhaps Chase could verify whether it would be acceptable if we were to find um, the findings for the variance have been met and whether the previous DOB objection is satisfactory. So um, my, I have notes that say there was a defect in the prior DOB objection and I don't really know why. So I don't know whether this very elaborate ZRD1 objection um, would cure that. I, I don't know what was wrong with the prior objection. So. Um, they should also provide an attic plan, assuming that we can make the finding, the A finding, and the, and the hardship finding. Um, provide an attic plan and show where structural headroom exceeds five feet 
and in section where it is under a sloping roof that complies with section 23-142B in the lower density growth management area where the rise to run is seven to one. Um, uh, that's not being shown, so you can't get a, you can't get that extra bonus unless you are in a sloping roof. Um, whereas, and um, so we need to see the um, calculations, the um, floor area calculations for that where structural headroom is <coughs> over five feet. And I didn't find anything on neighborhood character. We discussed at the last hearing that the building was tall compared to adjacent structures. So we need something on this. We, we don't have anything. Um, other comments from anyone? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I do have two, um, two comments very quickly. The first one is the, the applicant is stating in, in his submission that the ownership history shouldn't be a concern of BSA. I, I believe that this is, this is inaccurate. The, the other thing is... Inaccurate. Inaccurate, yeah. yes. And the other thing is the... Um, oh, before I forget, there is, a, there is a mistake on drawing A-100.00 right below the table for the floor area calculations where it says FAR of 0.599. It says is greater than 0.6. It should be is oh. less than yeah. 0.6. Okay. Uh, and looking at... Drawing A-102.00. I'm not sure if the covered porch was considered as a floor area. If the what? The covered oh, porch. The porch. There is a cover, covered porch on the second floor. If you look at the mm, plan for yeah. the second floor. Mm. The, the covered porch. Porch, porch yes. yes. Is, is this a three-sided space? Was it considered as oh. floor area? Because I looked at the floor area calculations and I don't think this was considered as part of the floor area. So normally it wouldn't be if it's if it's if it's enclosed on three sides um, by walls that exceed 42 inches I think is the number then it becomes floor area. Um, so I just don't know whether it's I, I, I believe it was not counted as floor right. area, and it's so easy to enclose it after the grant after and after the construction. And I'm not sure. I looked at the uh, Google. But that would view. be illegal. So you know, we can't. We're not allowed. By the way, a court told us that we're not allowed to consider future illegal behavior um, in terms of our grant. But in terms of making the um, the porch not floor area, the fact that it's on a, you know, when we see balconies, you often see inset balconies, for example, and the zoning resolution has a description about inset balconies. And it says, which is effectively what that is, because it has a roof, right? So um, it needs to meet the requirements of floor, not floor area in order not to count as floor area. Yes, but a portion of that size, I, I looked at, like, almost all the houses all around the, mm -hmm. that site location and I couldn't see a, even a single house was was a similar space that that large so I'm, I'm not sure I, I believe either they enclose it and and count it as floor area in this case the floor area ratio would jump to yes. 0.8 something or they could simply reduce it and, and I believe this is one of the items that's driving the height for the building. So it's yes. it's driving the need for another level. And if, if this space is enclosed and used as a floor area, they could live with two floors. Right. Oh, I see. Or at least they could play. Mm -hmm. I don't like I don't like the layout for actually the floors. I believe they. Do. I understand that we're grant, granting the the or we may be granting the, the rear yard or the side yard, whatever, that the distance between that side and the side right behind it. I don't think if we grant something, we should grant it to be zero. It could be, they could live with, instead of a zero space between this building and the building behind, they could live with something intermediate between zero and the requirement. Mm -hmm. And if, again, if this space is added to the floor area, that could enable them to leave some sort of a smaller than required yard 
between the proposed construction and the building right behind. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, just uh, so you're saying there should be some space between the proposed and the building adjacent as opposed to it Something's built right up. Can, can I just know uh, which building are you referring uh, the to? The building to the south, I think. Mm -hmm. The building at the bottom. Yeah, at the bottom. Yeah. So that's a one story taxpayer building. So if you were to provide any space, then it's like a three, you need a minimum of three feet, otherwise, you can't physically get to it. They right? Get that. Yeah, so, and and then it probably needs a waiver because that's a side yard, so it's an additional waiver, right? Because the side yard has to be, I believe, a minimum of eight feet once. I don't remember. Yes. It's, yes. Either, it's either zero or eight, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, so it means that we'd be adding another waiver, which is okay if, right? But the at the moment, the building is being, that's the proposed, right? Yes. Yeah, the building is being pushed up against the property line on the other side where the only way you can get to it is um, going on to the other guy's property to, to access it for maintenance, right? But wh why are you saying there should be a space between the two buildings? It's better from the perspective of light and air, I believe. For which building? The for existing? The proposed, for the proposed building? No, no, the existing building, that building right the is it I commercial? You don't have the right to open windows. It's, it, right. If they open any windows, it should be illegal. But, but they don't have light in there, no. right? There. So I'm not. I'm not really sure why you're saying that. So like, abutting buildings is a pretty standard thing in this neighborhood and lots of neighborhoods, right? Where you're doing the semi-attached or the or the row house where they all are attached. So I'm not sure what you mean by lighted air because there's no windows either permitted or shown on the proposed project. Yes, but my understanding is they are requesting a waiver for the distance between their building and the building right below. Am I correct or yes, am they're I not providing they're not providing the eight foot side yard um, uh, that yes. would be required. So and instead of eight feet, they are asking for just nothing. Nothing, right? But My in, point, yes, go yeah, ahead. in part because I think the original building that sat on that site did exactly that. And they're squishing this building down to that location because of the shape of the site, because it's a triangle, so you want to be at the base of the triangle, right? I, I, I get why they would be dropping the building all the way down as much. I'm trying to understand what's the downside of having it be right up against the property line? I believe it's architecturally better. I'm, an, I'm, I'm not an architect. Architecturally, it could be better to leave... Some space. Yes. Mm -hmm. Air circulation-wise, probably. Can I weigh in as mm -hmm. one of the architects not licensed, though? <laughs> and uh, I think in terms of the site plan, um, as you mentioned, Chair, um, this is a triangle and it's kind of picking up on the, trying to locate a building in the widest portion of the triangle. And what also is tricky with this site is that it needs to provide a driveway entrance and the driveway is close enough to the intersection, but it has to be far enough for it to operate in a safe way. So trying to kind of keep a balance between that and then having the location of the building are the two things I think the building is having struggling is with. struggling to locate. Yeah. So and the way this building has located itself is that it's tried to put what we mostly see in apartment buildings. You put the kitchens and the bathrooms away where you don't need natural ventilation, and put where all the legal light and air windows are required. So in this case, uh, you know they're trying to provide the light and air in a so-called your own open space and not necessarily on Target uh, Street, which is a main street. So that's why the living room and the bedrooms are all opening onto this little portion of the triangle um, so that you kind of feel like you have your little oasis yeah, of an open yard, space, a yard, yeah. kind of a so-called yard, because yeah. the Target being a, a more of an active street, you don't want your bedrooms and living rooms opening onto it. So. That's kind of how I read the plan mm -hmm. as to way it has shaped, and that's one of the reasons why they provided the covered porch on the second floor because they don't have any space for any open space at the street level because then you're exposed to all the street activities on Target. And it's, mm -hmm. it, 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 I mean, 
And this goes back to the financing part of how you market it and what makes some of these features marketable enough. But I know that's not one of the aspects, but I can see the reasonableness in the design of this building um, to make it suitable for a family living. Mm. Well, the, the other thing about it is that short of making it follow the, the angle of Tarji, the, there's this concern about getting too close. Like the community was opposed to this project because they think there should be front yards, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's a, a part of the box that gets very close to the front lot line. And so the further you pull it forward, the closer and closer you get to the front lot line. This is maintaining, what is it, a four foot? Um, but the required is 10 no, foot. No, but what's it It's showing? maintaining four feet. It's maintaining just four portion. feet at the point from the front lot line. So as you pull the, the thing forward, you either chamfer the corner or you get closer and closer to the front lot line. Now, when I say forward, I mean up, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not talking about moving the upper edge any further to up, but I'm talking about that porch area that could be enclosed. <coughs> I understand and that. Added and actually some, somehow molten into the entirely out of the building to allow moving the lower edge three feet probably four feet leaving some some breathe for the kitchen and for the bathroom which the bath I don't, i'm not sure if the bathroom on they the third have windows. floor they don't have windows has, has any light and air I, I don't see any windows there well, that's that's my point and in the meantime i don't see any reason for 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 that what is the dimension of this? 22 by 11, open space. That's not counted as floor area. Mm -hmm. That's significant, 400. No, you're talking about that space that's open to below? Is that what you're talking about? On the second floor. The space open to below or yeah. the porch? No, the covered porch on the second floor. Covered porch. No, yeah. I, I understand. No, I, I understand what you're saying. But, you know, obviously if you move the second floor forward, it's affecting your first floor and where your staircases are in your layout, right? So it means the solution would be to take the entire box and shift it forward if you're going to create a side yard, or right? Or play with the layout of the building yeah. to, to yeah. achieve the goal without moving the upper edge mm -hmm. further north. Okay, okay so these are, these are comments that, yeah. I don't feel strongly about creating a side yard there, but... Um, I'm not an architect. Yeah, yeah. If you believe that it is okay like that, I'm... Mostly, I'm, you know, one of the reasons is because that's where the house was originally. If you look at the Sanborn yes. map, yes. Yes. it I, more I or less that. looked like this picture. Yes. I don't know how much floor area it had because we don't have that information, but it's actually Someone sort of funny. 20 square feet yeah. somewhere I dread. Okay. So they f were able to find somewhere information. I could be. Yeah. Um, but so uh, that's one reason where I'm like, well, they're actually just building the historically strange little house that was sitting on that little triangle up until I'm not sure when it was demoed. Um, actually, that I, I, I the ZRD1 actually talks about demolition right, in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was in the 70s that it was demolished. So in other words, the community is sort of used to this little house that was up against the property line since the begin since really a long time, so since the twenties probably. I don't know how can they reduce the height of the building and yeah. the height issue without. Right. So I agree that you could bring the height down by either eliminating the porch, but you could also bring the height down by. It's a very tall roof line. Mm -hmm. They could bring it down by reducing. The height of that roof line it, it's it's unnecessary i think it's 17 feet especially the over the staircase i mean that can yeah. be minimized and there's some ways of just shaping the roof line that can bring the height yeah okay i mean i'd say from a, an architectural point of view the blank wall on the side is disturbing so you know that should be if you if you manage that in a way so that it's not just a blank wall but actually had openings that would be a more residential solution but part of it is when they look at the you look at the street view 
because it's next to this little one-story taxpayer, it's very obvious. But you only you don't only see it in context of the one-story taxpayer. It's on a row of houses and in a neighborhood of houses, right? That are shorter than that, but nonetheless. Yeah, I think the roof line can be played with to bring the appearance of the height down. Yeah. And, and not to emphasize the staircase. If you de-emphasize the staircase, that also eliminates the verticality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though it's sort of cute to have a tower stair. But, all right. Yeah, just given the location of it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, we have an, we have an, more significantly, we have the initial findings that need to be cleared before we dig into the, the design of the house. Though. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Item number 20, 2019, 64 BZ, 1334 East 24th Street, Brooklyn. Um, okay. On the demolition plan for the second floor um, that was submitted, I'm not understanding how the 7 foot 3 inch, 15 foot 4 inch, and 18 foot 8 inch lengths are being counted if the demolition plan and existing conditions plan shows those lengths non-contiguous and broken, um, not consistent with the diagrammatic existing condition plan. Um, uh, similar, I'm not, similarly, I'm not understanding the measurement of the perimeter walls of the attic were counted presently as floor area. And all this by way of saying the shape of the existing plan is different than the shape of the sort of schematic existing plan that they use to measure existing walls to remain. They're just different drawings. And so I don't, I don't know how to uh, reconcile those differences. Um, they need to provide the zoning calculation drawings that indicate where the structural headroom in the attic exceeds eight feet. Um, and um, otherwise, the requested changes to total floor area and rear yard setback were made. Um, we didn't receive an expl explanation about how the first floor joists will be raised without compromising the existing structure. We've been receiving um, from a couple of architects these really good sort of diagrammatic drawings that show how you do that, how you remove the joists, how you lift the joists without the whole structure falling apart or being basically a demolition and those should be, uh, that drawing should be included in the set. Anybody else? Oh, and bring the architect and the client must attend this hearing. Item number 21, 2-10BZ and 2019-193BZ. This is 2018, 222 2nd Avenue, East 13th Street, East 14th Street, 310 East 14th Street, um, 302 13 East 14th Street, 300 East 14th Street, 326 East 14th Street. This is the New York Eye and Ear Firmary um, site. Okay. So a very detailed response to our questions and summary of our discussion at the hearing was submitted along with revised drawings. A five foot increase to the setback at the eighth floor mechanical roof was provided from 13th Street, which I think is a good improvement. The drawings are very clear and the diagrams very useful and clear, explain all of the site conditions. I have to say it was an absolute pleasure reading this submission compared to so many others that don't um, rise to this level. Um, I just want to clarify that the hatching for elevator shafts that's shown and stairs that's shown on the floor plans is not intended to indicate that these do not count towards floor area since they do. Not sure why they're hatched other than to make it easy to find where circulation is. Um, um, also, they should clarify that the proposed building will be seven stories with a screened rooftop mechanical area that is labeled on the elevations and sections as eighth floor, since there's also a floor plan labeled ninth floor. Um, and it kind of repeats the eighth floor drawing, so it makes it confusing about the new building. I understand that the ninth floor is actually about the north building, but uh, it means that you shouldn't be showing the same plan of the eighth floor. Um, I see the study that was done to show 
um, why the exterior ramp is the desired solution, but I frankly don't see why in the face of an enormously costly project that will unavoidably impact residents in other ways, the pedestrians of 14th Street should have to forevermore compensate for this compromise with a reduced width and unattractive sidewalk condition. <coughs> I also don't see why the studies only looked at a ramp in parallel to the street as, a, as opposed to one running perpendicular to it inside the building parallel to immediately adjacent to the exit stair. Um, DOT apparently has similar concerns about the ramp. Um, 14th Street is a heavy pedestrian street, and if not at the moment as densely populated it, 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 as it is um, a block to the west, it most certainly will become so in the future, both with this new building and with future development. It's just the reality of 14th Street. The population keeps charging east. Um, signage calculations and drawings indicate that all of the signs will be illuminated and exceed greatly the maximum areas permitted for signage in general and especially um, the, the maximum areas for illuminated. Um, in the interest of not presenting a nuisance to area residents, consideration should be given for the directions that these illuminated signs are facing and whether some might be um, night, some might not be illuminated at all or put timers to dim significantly or go off after 10 p.m. Um, they should discuss in greater detail as to the specific signage that may be visible to residents, what the purpose of the illumination is, in particular the signs that will be mounted high in the building. Reference was made to other variances for signage for hospitals that were given by this board. <coughs> But the NYU Langone signage provided, um, the, their example, is mounted low and isn't illuminated except for the word emergency. Um, none of, and I'm familiar with the Columbia Presbyterian, which is just pylons. I don't remember whether they're illuminated, but they're, maybe they go to 20 feet high. It's nothing like this height. None of the variances referred to in the statement of facts for signage for other hospital locations were for signs as large as or mounted as high as those proposed here. So I ask, why must the 400 square foot signs mounted at a height of 110 feet be illuminated? Um, you know, I think about it in other places where the argument is how will the ambulance know how to get to the hospital? There's a symbol of an H and it indicates how how, where the hospital is, you follow the H, and there's often H's on highways and so on, and an H would be plenty to indicate there's the hospital. Um, so I don't see why we need to have this gigantic logo, and um, by the way, this board deals a lot of the times with signs that are enormous logos, and um, so I'm concerned about precedent for logos at a very, very high <coughs> building. Um, there are open DOT issues. Um, I believe we have air quality and noise sign off and LPC sign off. Um, I'm not clear whether DEP is requiring the updated phase two now or whether that's some kind of future activity. I'll check. Okay. I think they might have done that already, but I'll check. And I didn't see it submitted, okay. right? So I don't know whether there, it's like an E designation or something like that or. No, I have to check. Okay. Other comments? Um, no, I, as you, as you said, um, the application um, that was submitted, the, the follow-up was very, very thorough, and uh, I think the setback that, that has been proposed is sufficient, and I really didn't have any other comments, but I was thrilled to read the additional submission that was made was very clear. No, just uh, they addressed the uh, issue of the subcellar uh, construction and, and um, they said it's, it's going to be too difficult, too costly, and I, I take that. Mm -hmm. That was the, the discussion was about using more cellar development to make the building shorter. Right? Go. 
<laughs> New cases, item number one, 2018-15 BC. 250 West 26th Street, Manhattan. We received a letter of objection from the fire department. Oh. Yeah. Uh, they issued oh. the Bureau's licensed public place of assembly, has inspected these premises and issued two violation orders, one of which is failure to have the exit door open to the direction of egress, mm -hmm. failure to obtain certificate of operation and plans for the Department of Buildings. So once they do that, they, you know. So this supersedes their no comment letter from earlier then? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. We just received that, so it's uploaded. Okay. All right, so we have, this is a legalization that opened in January of 2013. Um, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. We also have proof of posting a public hearing in the lobby. Community board recommends approval. We have three letters in support. We have authorization from both the landlord and the tenant because it wasn't clear who the applicant is, but it's really the tenant. Um, we, I didn't find DOI. DOI's there. It's there? Okay. Can you send me the DOI? I didn't find it in the folder. Okay. Um, uh, we have, uh, okay, now we have a letter of objection from fire department. Um, I'd like them to provide a first floor plan that shows the egress from both fire stairs to the street. It's only showing egress to one, from one fire stair. So, and one of them is a, is a wraparound stair. I'm not even sure it's allowed to be a means of egress, but people will run to it anyway because it's a staircase, so it needs to show how you get to the street. Anybody else on this? No? Yeah, I, I see that there is an inconsistency between the hour of operation that w was presented to the uh, community board and those mentioned in the statement of facts. There is kind of like half an hour every every time window is like expanded by like half an hour, either in the morning or in the afternoon. So I'm not sure if this Which can affect right. anything. The other thing is they are talking about adding four floors uh, on top of the building. Uh, so I'm not sure if these floors are going to be residential. Should, should, oh, right. should we like be careful about the sound attenuation and mm -hmm. the vibration okay. issue? Uh, yeah, so I have a question about that prospective use of these <coughs> floors. Uh, this is a uh, it's a it's come. It's this is a jujitsu. Yes. Yeah. So, so they don't have bikes. What kind of operation is it? Yeah. They don't have. They don't have bicycles or or, or oh, bags. They, they, they just pretty much roll around on the on a mat. It's yeah. about two and a half inches, three inches thick. Okay. So as far as sound attenuation, I'm, I'm not the most concerned. Although I didn't see the fire department letter. Was that sent out? Yeah. That was just this morning, apparently. Uh, right. Yeah. It was sent 10:52 a.m. to you guys. Anyway, I'm not very concerned about the sound attenuation for. Uh, and usually, when you add to a building, you're it's almost <coughs> like you're doubling up the sound attenuation because you are you've got the existing roof. I mean, I don't know. You know, in other words, there's a lot of distance between the last existing floor and the new floor, so you actually have a better kind of natural insulator between the lower one and the next one. If you're adding right before, or right right on top of that. <laughs> gym or whatever source of vibrations it's it's you're creating a problem ah, but okay. yes if if, <coughs> if if the new floors will act as like additional insulation i wouldn't i wouldn't be concerned mm -hmm. the, the other thing is the elevation view i understand that the construction might be in progress right now but the elevation didn't actually show that elevation view in that submission didn't didn't show any like construction above the existing right. building mm -hmm. so they can just add an order i'm not i'm not yeah. asking them to show like the current situation of the proposal of that ongoing construction but just put a note on the on the drawings on the elevation drawing mentioning that there is there is ongoing construction that's only if they're going ahead and doing it because the piece is, well this is of course the owner is the applicant but if, the, if they're actually proceeding with the construction as opposed to that's something they're going to desire down the road, 
you know, I think that there's a difference, right? If it's just something where in the future we're kind of working on the idea we're going to add four floors, that's different than they've actually started to do the work. I thought they said they started. Well, that's the thing. I don't, I don't know the situation, so that's why I don't want to have a note and then they never build the floors, right? But on the other hand, if they're actually, they had a permit and they're starting to drop columns and all that stuff, then that's a different thing. If, if what I read in the statement of facts is, is if, if I recall that I, yeah. they, if the construction is ongoing, I yes. would, I yeah, would yeah. like to see something okay. on the drawing. Mm -hmm. This is not for even us, it's for the accuracy of the conditions described on the drawings. Mm -hmm. If you have, the adding four floors, if you, let's say they have added two floors so far, if the drawing just showing the three-story or whatever story building without these two floors, the drawings could be looked at as inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't, I, I understand what you're saying. We're not, we don't really regulate what happens. Most of the time we don't even ask for a building elevation. We ask for what's the front entrance of your PC okay. look at like okay. from the street so we can see the signs. And if it's on the ninth floor, we don't ask for the elevation of the whole building because that's a lot for the architect who's hired to do the PCE to deal with. You know what I mean? The architect who's hired that's to do the PCE enough. does that's a floor plan, okay. right? Okay. And we ask for the first floor because we need to know that we have egress and ADA access, right? Okay. I got it. All right. Move on. Mm-hmm. Item number 2, 2019-76-BZ, 1973 East 16th Street, Brooklyn. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and a proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community board recommends approval with six opposed. Um, they need to show the walls to be legalized as new, not existing. These cannot count towards existing material to be retained. And the illegal garage should not be counted as existing either. Um, on the demo drawings, um, they need to stay referencing in feet and inches. Don't mix decimal points with feet and, in and inches. Um, walls to be retained should be dimensioned on the plans and match the walls to be retained as shown on the demo drawings. This is always a problem, the inconsistency among these drawings. We need to ha see, get a survey because there's a claim about what's existing and the dimensions and we don't really know what they are. Um, they need to put legends on the site plan to explain the meaning of hatching, etc. cetera. Um, dimension all exterior walls and setbacks on the plans and sections. Provide floor area calculation diagrams. Uh, it's particularly important in the attic where some is under structural headroom. On the question of what is the illegal condition of the side yards. The existing garage was probably built illegally since it's not on the pre-61 Sanborn map and also notably an anomaly from development patterns in the neighborhood. So um, the side yard width is 10 foot 2 on that side. So the information should be corrected. However, the proposed modifications establish the minimum total side yard width required by 23-461 and 2348. So those that's OK. The, the reduction in the side yard is OK because it's still within the minimum total. Um, the yard study and statement of facts makes no justification for the 20-foot rear yard at the second floor in the context of the neighbors. Um, the third floor has a compliant rear yard. Surrounding properties have fully compliant rear yards at the second floors. Um, this house is much taller than its neighbors at 39 feet, and I don't see how that height is being used to make the third floor occupiable, so they should reduce the height. It's just an enormous top floor for no reason other than wanting to have sort of chateau-esque um, roof line. So, any other comments? No, I agree with you. Okay. Okay, done? Yes. This concludes the public review session for February 24th, 2020. <laughs> Okay. Camera's still on.